Hi, and welcome to Japan This Week, a news roundup from Japan Today for November 29th, 2024. I'm Jeff Richards, and here's what we have coming up in this episode. Japan and the U.S. have announced they will set up missile units to deal with a what-if Taiwan scenario. A high-profile car crash saga has ended with the death of the convicted defendant. Police will recommend or record charges against a young woman who leapt to her death and also killed an innocent bystander. If you've lost something in the megalopolis of Tokyo, chances are the police department has it. A furry critter with a shoe fetish has been discovered as the thief stealing kindergartner's shoes to much relief from the parents. So now, let's get into those headlines. The U.S. and Japan have announced that the U.S. military will set up temporary bases along Japan's Nansei Island chain and the Philippines to deploy missile units if a Taiwan contingency arises. Contingency, let's just be clear, is referring to a hypothetical scenario in which military conflict arises around Taiwan, such as China launching military action, heightened regional tensions involving the island requiring military intervention, that sort of stuff. This move is part of the first joint operation plan between Japan and the U.S. focusing on potential conflicts involving Taiwan and China. The U.S. Marine Littoral Regiment, a division that specializes in shallow water operations, will be stationed along the island chain from Kagoshima and Okinawa prefectures towards Taiwan. In a crisis, the U.S. Marines will use temporary bases on these inhabited islands. Japan's self-defense forces, the SDF, will provide logistical support, including fuel and ammunition. Now, this occurs in the context of of the U.S. and Japan strengthening defense ties in response to threats from China's military buildup in the area, North Korea's missile programs, and growing military ties between Russia and North Korea. Let's not forget that North Korea is very close to Japan, and Russia, in fact, borders it. Now, this announcement has elicited a response from Russia. Moscow warned that U.S. missiles in Japan would threaten Russian security. They vowed to retaliate if U.S. medium-range missiles are deployed. Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova accused Japan of escalating tensions over Taiwan to justify stronger ties with the U.S. Zakharova pointed to a hypersonic missile test in Ukraine last week meant to highlight Russia's military capabilities. This story sparked 88 comments on Japan Today within a very short time of it being published. Readers discussed the risks of escalating tensions and the potential impact on Japan's security. The following are just a few of the comments, and just note that these have been edited for clarity and brevity. Samit Basu writes, Just remember that if the U.S. fires missiles from Japanese islands, Japan too becomes an active combatant of Taiwan war and China has the right to strike positions of an active enemy combatant, presumably Tokyo. Thank you. Summit. This is sobering and this is definitely food for thought for people out there. After mentioning Vietnam and the Korean War, Woody Lee offers, Taiwan will not be any different. If a war breaks out, the people of Taiwan are the ultimate decision makers and they will decide the nation's fate. Perhaps they will, perhaps they won't. I'm not exactly sure how well armed the people are if China comes in, but that's a good point. From Tokyo Guy, I mean, I applaud the subtext. Taiwan needs to be protected from China in much the same way Ukraine needs to be protected from Russia. It's a simple matter of good versus evil, but these these days, any attempt to take a side instantly gets you labeled as a saber-rattling warmonger. Not much room for nuance. Yes, I'm certainly not a war hawk, but that's pretty self-explanatory. And JJE gives us... Tokyo needs to understand that by hosting offensive U.S. systems, it is putting itself in the firing line. Nor can it claim self-defense over non-UN recognized Taiwan province. It will be an active combatant, thus a legitimate target. Non-UN recognized Taiwan province sounds very imperialistic. <laughs> 
A 93-year-old former top bureaucrat who was serving a sentence for a high-profile 2019 Tokyo car accident that left two people dead has died in prison. Kozo Izuka, a former chief of the now-defunct Agency of Industrial Science and Technology, died last month around three years into his five-year prison term. Izuka ran a red light after mistaking the gas pedal for the brake hitting and killing Mana Matsunaga, 31, and her three-year-old daughter, Riko, who were cycling through a crosswalk in Tokyo's Ikebukuro area on April 19, 2019. Nine other people were also injured in the incident. He was later ordered by the court to pay around 140 million yen, about just shy of a million bucks, to the bereaved family members of the accident. Takuya Matsunaga, the 38-year-old husband and father of the victims, who campaigned to seek severe punishment for Izuka and has been engaged in road safety activism, expressed his condolences on X, formerly known as Twitter. He wrote, As a society, we should not continue to criticize him, but learn from his experiences and together consider a path to avoid a tragedy like this happening again. This was a major inciting incident that stirred debate on preventing accidents involving older drivers in a graying Japan and prompted many drivers of advanced years to give up their licenses. Let's hear what Japan Today readers had to say. Lord of Flies writes, Seriously, if there were more people as civilized as Mr. Matsunaga, the world would be a much better place. I cannot fathom the pain he has suffered, yet he finds it in his heart to take a higher road. Absolutely. I agree 100%. Faito writes, Mr. Matsunaga has shown dignity and grace in the face of tragedy. Rest in peace to his wife and precious little girl. I wonder if this lying, nasty piece of work is Zuka paid the compensation he owed. 100% of his assets should now be confiscated and allocated towards accident victims. Yes, I think we're all in agreement that Mr. Matsunaga is a cut above most of us in terms of how he's treating people and moving on from such terrible tragedy. I don't believe, and this is just my personal opinion, that Izuka had paid 100% of the compensation. He was only three years into a five-year prison sentence, and he probably had some time to pay off that money. I don't know how it works in Japan, but they should probably at least confiscate his assets to the tune of 140 million yen. Here is a follow-up to a tragic story we reported on in the September 6th episode. I'll put a card up to that podcast for our YouTube listeners right here so they can jump to it if they wish. In a rather unusual decision, police in Yokohama have referred to prosecutors the case of a 17-year-old female high school student who jumped from a building and killed herself along with a pedestrian who was walking below. The charge they are recommending is gross negligence resulting in death. Police say the girl was old enough to recognize that she could be at risk of hitting pedestrians walking below, if she was even thinking. They've asked for an indictment to be officially recorded. Now, this incident occurred on August 31st. The girl, who was from Chiba Prefecture, jumped from the 12th floor deck of a shopping center directly connected to JR Yokohama Station just before 6 p.m. She hit a woman, Chikako Chiba, who was walking with three friends. The two were taken to hospital. The girl died at around 7 p.m., while Chiba died of her injuries at 9.40 p.m. A glass barrier, two and a half meters high, is installed on the rooftop plaza to prevent falls. And based on security camera footage and witness accounts, the girl had climbed over this fence. The story, as you can imagine, is fraught with many philosophical conundrums. So let's hear what Japan Today readers had to say about this. Purple depressed bacon offers. The girl is dead, though, so why are they prosecuting posthumously? Two lives already lost. No need to drag this tragedy out further in court. Yeah, I don't think they're trying to drag it out further in court. And I don't think we should just drop it. It's tragic that the girl jumped to her death, but she landed on an innocent bystander. If the crime is recorded, the family of the girl who did act irresponsibly could be held liable or at least the charge could help prevent 
another person from doing it if they're in fact thinking about it. Also in America writes, Under Japanese law, the act of committing suicide itself is not a crime. However, if a suicide attempt causes harm to others or property, the individual may be held liable for damages. I think they mean the individual's estate. Or surviving family members. Under the Japanese Civil Code, Article 714 states that the guardians of a minor may be held liable for damages caused by the minor if the child is found incapable of understanding the consequences of their actions. As the child is deceased in this case, the parents would have a tough time mounting a defense if sued in civil court. Yes, if the surviving family of the innocent bystander were to take this to court, I'm sure the family would have a tough time. I'm not sure whether either of the families want to prolong this tragedy, but I would think that they both want to prevent this from happening in the future. And from Thunderbird 2, So someone with obvious mental health issues kills herself and accidentally kills someone else in the process is to be prosecuted after her death. Are the grieving relatives of the accidentally killed woman going to demand compensation from the grieving parents of the girl who killed herself? Seems rather unsavory to me. Yeah, I'm not sure what is so unsavory about that. Thunderbird 2, there was a tragic suicide, and in the process of the tragic suicide, a murder happened. And Tamarama writes, A lot of people seem unable to grasp that someone who is contemplating suicide is at their lowest and darkest point, and thinking rationally or reasonably is either very difficult or impossible at that point. I bet the poor kid didn't want to hurt someone else. I bet she wished she wasn't in a mental state where she was considering jumping off a building. Society and the people around her have probably already failed her enough. Why now try to punish her further? That's so dumb. To those here at Japan today that think these people are selfish cowards, all I can say is take a knee this morning and say a little prayer to whoever that you don't ever find yourself in the same situation. It seems to me that people are getting very binary about this really sad story. A young girl in the prime of her life committed suicide. In the process, she killed somebody. There need to be repercussions. I know that everybody involved has already gone through a lot, but perhaps recording this as a crime will help in the future or at least give pause to people thinking about jumping from a building. No matter which way you slice it, this is a terrible story. Lost your umbrella? Keys? Perhaps a flying squirrel? In Tokyo, the police are almost certainly taking meticulous care of it. In Japan, lost items are rarely disconnected from their owners for long, even in a megacity like Tokyo, population 14 million. Around 80 staff at the police center in Tokyo's Inabashi district ensure items are well organized. They use a database system, according to director Harumi Shoji. Everything is tagged and sorted to hasten a return to its rightful owner. ID cards and driving licenses are most frequently lost, Dogs, cats, and even flying squirrels and iguanas have been dropped off at police stations, where officers look after them consulting books, online articles, and vets for advice. More than 4 million items were handed in to Tokyo Metropolitan Police last year, with about 70% of valuables such as wallets, phones, and important documents successfully reunited with their owners. If no one turns up at the police facility within three months, the items are sold or discarded. Wireless earphones and handheld fans are an increasingly frequent sight at the Lost and Found Center, which has been operating since the 1950s. Side note, handheld fans here could be the battery-powered fans in Japan's and Tokyo's uber-hot summertime period. They could also be the sensu, those folding fans that most people think of when they think of Japanese geisha, kimonos, and things like that. But a whopping 200 square meters, just over 2,100 square feet, are dedicated to lost umbrellas, 300,000 of which were brought in last year with only 3,700 of them returned. Umbrellas are obviously an outlier on that 70% figure we stated just a minute ago about people being reunited with their items. And are Japan Today readers lost in amazement? 
Grund writes, This is truly one of the amazing things about Japan. I also lost my wallet last year, and after a few hours of frantic searching, I got a call from the local police station. Apparently, I had dropped it while stopping at a gas station. Somebody had found it and took the time to drop it off at the police station. Of course, with all the contents there. It's amazing as well how this kind of kindness spreads when you expect others to act kindly and deliver law lost items to the police or station managers, it becomes natural to do the same yourself. Yes, I think everyone who lives here has an I lost my story. For me, it's been a stolen passport, Bluetooth speaker, and a phone. Patricia Yero offers, Millions of cheap plastic umbrellas. Is there any way to recycle that much plastic and spokes? I hear you. That's an awful lot of umbrellas. There has got to be a way to recycle them and get rid of them. They shouldn't be having 200 square meters devoted to umbrellas. Donate or sell the good ones and recycle the junk. This from Karotti. A lot of people might return things they find not because they're inherently kind to strangers, but more because they don't want to look bad or get judged for not returning them. Sure, there's a general respect for other people's property in Japan, but it's not some magical unique trait despite how the media often makes it seem. This kind of thing happens in plenty of other countries, too. Well, I agree with this as well, too. I think many people do it just out of societal pressure or the fear of judgment. But I'll take people returning lost and stolen items over the alternative, especially in such a massive city as Tokyo. I don't care how or why they give it back. Well, our final story was a crime story. But after the mystery was solved, it went national. Police thought a shoe thief was on the loose at a kindergarten in southwestern Japan until a security camera caught a furry culprit in action. A weasel with a tiny shoe in its mouth was spotted on the video footage after police installed three cameras in the school in Koga, Fukuoka Prefecture. Teachers and parents had feared it could be a disturbed person with a shoe fetish. The Japanese customarily take their shoes off before entering homes and also schools. They learn this when they're in kindergarten. The Vanna shoes were all slip-ons the children wore indoors that were stored in cubby holes near the door. Weasels are known to stash items, and people who keep weasels as pets give them toys so they can hide them. The weasels scattered shoes around and took 15 of them before police were called. Six more were taken the following day. The weasel then returned November 11th to steal one more shoe. The camera footage of that theft was seen the next day. Just one more job, then I retire. The shoe-loving weasel only took the white indoor shoes, the ones made of canvas, likely because they're very light to carry, or so the theory goes in this highbrow case. The children got a good laugh when they saw the weasel in the video. Although the stolen shoes were never found, rest assured the remaining shoes are now safe at the kindergarten with nets installed over the cubby holes. The weasel, which is believed to be wild, is still on the loose. Well, what did our crime fighters at Japan Today have to say about this story? Kemikal wrote, I don't get it. The prevention method here is to put a net up to cover the cubby holes. What are they doing to prevent the giant disease-carrying rat from entering the building? I can understand the shoes are exchanged for the cleanliness of the children while in class, but what about the germs the weasel is carrying and bringing in? No mention of trapping the weasel and moving it further away. I guess if that keeps you up at night... Could have been offers. Anyone spotting a weasel wearing slippers, please report the incident to the local police. Ba-dum-pa. And this from Dante K.H. Cute little fella. But is the door so open that anyone can enter there during children's classes? Surely someone had thought there should be more security for those small children. What if a mentally disturbed individual were to freely enter? Uh, Dante K.H., where do I start? First of all, I'm not sure that weasels actually need doors. I kind of think 
You and Chemical should start a Paw Patrol looking for disease-infested, mentally disturbed weasels to trap and move or rehome so the children will be safe. Just do it for the children. You'll have to explain this to the kids first, though. And that was a quick recap of the news from Japan This Week for Friday, November 29, 2024. Thanks to the Japan Today editors for the stories. Find those in the show notes below. Since the news from Japan never stops, you can and you should visit Japan Today at any time for all of the latest information. Thanks for tuning in to Japan this week. It would be great if you could rate and follow us wherever you get your podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. If you're listening or watching this on YouTube, please, please do us a solid and give us a like and a subscribe. It's the way that we can keep doing this for you. From the Japan Today newsroom at G Plus Media in Tokyo, I'm Jeff Richards. Join us again next week when we return with a quick recap of Japan's biggest and smallest stories. Sayonara, folks. Sayonara, folks.